Welcome to Clarifying Catholicism's Science of Catholic Teaching. In this series, we examine the Church's teachings on marriage and sexuality from a scientific perspective. Most of the studies cited in this series were compiled in Father Robert Spitzer's The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, a defense of her controversial moral teachings, and they can be found in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. Marriage and sexuality, two topics that I've been fascinated with for a long time. Perhaps it's because my formative years were dominated by debate over what marriage and gender are or ought to be. I remember the day gay marriage was legalized both in my home state of Oregon and later across the whole United States. It was a rather stressful time to be a Christian, though it was exciting in its own right, as the discourse surrounding these topics caused me as well as many others to look at them from a more secular scientific perspective. And that's precisely what's so spectacular about Father Robert Spitzer's book, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, a defense of her controversial moral teachings. This book not only addresses the Church's teachings on marriage and sexuality from a scientific perspective, citing hundreds of studies that justify them, but it also touches on dozens of other moral issues from abortion to euthanasia. I highly recommend Father Spitzer's book, which I am using as the cornerstone for this series. But before I go any further, I'd like to state a couple of disclaimers. First, to any skeptics of the Church's teachings, I ask that you enter this series with an open mind. We will be analyzing and discussing some topics many have deemed sensitive, from the impacts contraception has on relationships to STDs in the LGBT community. Conversely, I ask Catholics watching this series to avoid weaponizing these studies to discriminate, even inadvertently, against people who are mentioned in them. It's easy to turn people into numbers, forgetting that each of these numbers has a unique context whose situations are often difficult to judge. Basically, try not to be offended by this series, and likewise, try not to offend others with this information. Now that that's been clarified, let's dive in. There seems to be a pervasive idea that sexuality is an isolated instrument of human passion, that you can separate your sexual life from things like love, friendship, biology, etc. This, however, could not be further from the truth. As much as we would want to compartmentalize different things in our lives, such as sexuality, the truth is that it is impossible for humans to not allow sexuality to impact us psychologically, sociologically, biologically, etc. Even worse, sexuality, and more specifically, flaunting one's sexuality, has seemingly become a mark of maturity in the eyes of modern Western culture. It's all about body positivity. Be confident. Be bold, they say. Ironically, though, this logic doesn't make us mature at all. If anything, it makes us childish, selfish, and isolated. It's regressive. Father Spitzer posits there are four levels of happiness. Materialistic pleasure, ego comparative, contributive empathetic, and transcendent faith-based. Each successive level draws us out of a self-centered, hedonistic approach to happiness and into other-centered, giving approaches to happiness. Let's look at level one, materialistic pleasure. This level of happiness is essentially carnal gratification. It's concerned with fulfilling our most immediate pleasures, and it's most commonly fostered during childhood, since at that stage we can hardly empathize with others. In terms of sex, this is the part of human nature that finds sex, well, pleasurable. Now I must state, this stage isn't evil. It's the same stage that propels us to survive. It's the one that tells us, I'm hungry, I need food. Likewise, this is the stage of sexuality that tells us, ah, I find this person attractive. It's not bad, but being stuck at this level certainly can be, as we will explore later. Level two is ego comparative. This is the stage that develops once we've acquired a greater sense of social and self-awareness. We realize that others have sentience and needs, but it's centered on what the other person can offer you rather than what you can offer them. A corruption of this stage would be a utilitarian mindset, but this level in itself is not evil. Discovering that we need others to make us happy is not a bad thing. But like the previous stage, getting stuck here can be very problematic. 
Before we go any further, I must emphasize that moving on to the next stage doesn't mean abandoning the previous one. A marriage in which neither person finds each other attractive will fail. Likewise, a marriage in which neither person feels like they need the other will also collapse. Level three is contributive empathetic. At this point, you no longer solely focus on what others can give you, but you derive happiness from giving them what they need from you. It's when self-sacrifice enters the picture. Finally, level four is transcendent faith-based. This is when you not only derive happiness from making the other person happy, but because of the selflessness you gained from being with the other person, you now feel compelled to sacrifice for the good of all people, if not a higher power. It's like at this point, you've trained yourself, thanks to your spouse, to not only give to him or her, but all of humanity and ultimately God. This is what is so crucial and special about the bond between a man and a woman, which is celebrated in marriage. It is the ultimate exercise in surrendering one's own desires from an another person so much that it brings forth new life. That's the whole point in Genesis when it says that a man and a woman are destined to become one flesh. It's abandonment of the ego that turns us to live for others. Furthermore, Jesus Christ, as the fulfiller of God's law, not only cites Genesis in affirming God's law that sex's procreative nature binds the couple in flesh, but he goes a step further. He abolishes the Old Testament's provincial law that permitted divorce, and instead insists that no one can tear apart the bond created in marriage. These biblical passages form the backbone of the church's theology of marriage. Sexuality that leads to procreation is viewed as a major mark of maturity, whereas sex that is done without intending procreation is condemned. This is because sexuality and procreation are intrinsically linked. In having intercourse with someone of the opposite sex, you are 1. Admitting you desire them, 2. Admitting they can fulfill you in a way that you cannot fulfill yourself, 3. Renouncing the possibility of having sex with anyone else and giving yourself to them and your children. And four, imitating God's creativity by participating in the creation of new life. Thus, a good marriage engages all four levels that Spitzer describes. I mentioned that getting stuck on any of these levels, particularly the first two, can lead to problems. Obviously, if we get stuck on level one, materialistic pleasure, we alienate ourselves from other people. All we care about is our immediate gratification. In getting stuck on level two, we at least recognize the function of other people, but that's it. They're just a tool for us to possess or use. By having sex too soon, or for the wrong reasons, or without marriage, which is the mechanism to ensure the healthy development of levels three and four, you'll most likely be stuck at levels one and two. In Spitzer's words, having sex outside of marriage short circuits the development of friendship and relationship. It's like giving a two-year-old a jackhammer. This episode wasn't meant to be very statistics heavy, but I'll throw out a couple numbers that illustrate the benefits that levels three and four can have on a relationship, particularly a marriage. First of all, couples who pray together and thus participate in level four happiness feel greater relationship satisfaction. Second, spiritual intimacy correlates with more effective conflict resolution. Finally, belief in the sanctity of marriage correlates with increased marital satisfaction and compassionate love. Now, for centuries, the church's view of marriage was ingrained into Western society, but the same can't be said today. Next episode, we'll explore precisely what led to the shift in modern Western society's understanding of marriage. Until then, have a great day. God bless you.